Well, my name is Chavez Rosenfeld, when they are warning teachers things about economics. Patrick Irvin, just not blaming them or criticizing them. For years you've been denied access to it. It's Jackson, we really need to see social media and the internet as a trade. Um, another installment of the UI experience. Uh, gentlemen, if you just introduce yourself this evening, we're going to be discussing uh, Black Wall Street and how we can bring that era into the modern. I'm Chavez okay. Rosenthal from Kankakee, Illinois. Warren Edwards, Madison. Chicago. Patrick Irvin, Greenville. Oh. And Joseph Madison out of the Maryland, D.C. area. Okay, and I am LT, and I am out of Dallas, Texas, and I will be moderating this evening. Um, so we're just going to discuss community economics, and we're going to start it off with a little bit of the history of the original Black Wall Street. And Madison, you want to go ahead and kick it off and, and give us a little background on that? Sure thing. It started back in the early 1920s in um, just outside mm -hmm. of Tulsa, Oklahoma, it was Rose, Rosewood, I believe was the name of it, in Oklahoma. Um, little black boy, little white girl, small little incident that turned into a huge, just, just like an, a total decapitation of black wealth in the United States. Um, towns that had black lawyers, doctors, pilots, airports, um, if you name it as an amenity, hospitals. It existed there in that in that one town, um, and as a result of, of course, an already racial tension, um, there was a incident that led to the burning down of that town. In that town, blacks and Jews had shops that were next to each other. You know, it was a separate but equal type of scenario um, where everything was actually equal, but until <clears throat> at that particular point where um, things started to crumble. You know, it, it, it had its apex of black economic strength. Um, and I'll, I'll speculate just a little bit as a disclaimer. Is I believe that this is where a lot of the stigma of being a doctor and a lawyer and a professional um, came from, was that black Wall Street time frame back when everybody had, you know, it was a wealth that was passed from generation to generation. And once it got to a certain level, it came crumbling down. Um, I encourage anybody to go to Wikipedia, Google it, read the book, um, Wallace, and I can't remember the other author's name, wrote a book about it, and it, I think they were actually secondhand stories from someone in their bloodline, I believe their father or grandfather or something of that sort. Many people died black, white, Jewish, um, and beyond, and at, at that particular point, it started to change what we were as a culture in the United States of America. What well, what was the area of this again? I don't know if you um, mentioned it or not. It was just outside of Tulsa, Oklahoma. Greenwood. Okay. Greenwood. And what impact did um the Black Wall Street at that time what it what did it have on the country at the time? When you say what did it have on the country, what do you mean? Economically, um was it something known? to other blacks around the country, or was it centrally located to just the Midwest? Was it having an impact on the West Coast? Was it having an impact on the East Coast? What was the extent? I want to answer that with a question that I heard that I thought was powerful. Um, okay. They was talking about how um, 
the Holocaust, um, everybody's familiar with it because it's taught in school, and they taught it at around third grade. And the speaker had asked, why do you think that happened? And the, the answer was because they didn't want history to repeat itself. Then he turned around and said, how many people was familiar with Black Wall Street, and why do you believe that that was spoke about in school at an early age, and it was because they didn't want history to repeat itself. <laughs> wow. The example or a symbol, like you like to say, for the black race on being successful, it was showing us the power and the might of black-owned businesses and what a successful system looked like without having to rely on our white counterparts. And they destroyed that before it became public knowledge because they did not want us to get that momentum and that confidence to duplicate that system. Mm, wow. If I may, um, there were more. There was there was the tragic incident of Oklahoma, um, the only incident in history that you could probably find where America bombed one of its own cities from the air. There was also a strong black economic base in Durham, North Carolina that gets a lot less attention because it wasn't so so violently uh, destroyed. And in Durham, North Carolina, you had many different black millionaires, black businesses, out of plenty. Um, there were two black bus lines, uh, three black cab companies. You know, you just had a bunch of different black uh, businesses in Durham, North Carolina, to show that, what was occurring in Oklahoma, what was occurring in Tulsa, Oklahoma, wasn't an uh, 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 anomaly. It wasn't Isolated. a freak of occurrence. Right. It was something that blacks were doing all over the country. Um, when given a chance to liberate themselves, uh, all over the country, uh, there were pockets of economic free towns, if you will popping up all over the country where blacks were beginning to do better than their white counterparts. Now, the, the Durham, North Carolina incident didn't end on the same note that the Tulsa, Oklahoma incident ended. The Durham, North Carolina incident ended, so far as what I've been able to find, um, with integration. When integration happened, black people stopped frequenting black businesses because they could now frequent white businesses. And those mm. black business owners went out of business. Black bus lines had to close down because nobody wanted to ride a black bus where they could always sit on the front of the bus and could always get that level of service when now they were able to get on a white bus and sit up front next to the bus driver and look out the window in the front of the bus. You know, so, and it's not blaming them or criticizing them. For years you've been denied access to this, and now all of a sudden you can do it. So, of course, you're going to want to go and do it. But, okay. you know, that's just, that was just another another incident to say that the Tulsa, Oklahoma incident wasn't isolated. So, again, it sounds to me like it's pointing out exactly what was just stated, that to separate a people from the knowledge of a successful endeavor that easily could have carried them into the same type of success and affluence as the dominant culture was completely removed from the history books, if not ever taught at all. Am I wrong to um, going way, way, way back to ancient Egypt and showing how that was systematically destroyed as well? Because it was right. systematically destroyed, but now that they're digging and digging and digging, and they're finding more and more and more about this richness oh, yeah. in history that can't be uncovered. Yeah. Black Wall Street and Durham are exactly the same, but now we have the ability to ex access and exchange that information, which means that now that we're uncovering some of this stuff, there's something being worked on right now to replace that. So we need to get ahead of the curve and stay in mm -hmm. tune with the history at the same time. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about that. Now, when we talk about Wall Street, we understand that to be a matter of trading commodities and trading it's to the point they can trade anything. Now, are we talking about when we discuss community economics, Are we and we say Black Wall Street, are we looking to have it traded um, or, or trading of goods? Are we just looking to ensure that our communities are starting to get built up with black businesses that we frequent? What are we looking to 
established. I think we're looking to do both of them because that was one of the things that um, Marcus Garvey did as well, and that's actually how they got him um, out of power, so to speak, by planning bogus uh, investment charges on them. But when you deal with investments, then that's huge from an economic standpoint. Um, a lot of people are familiar with the cash flow quadrant, and what you want to do is you want to move to the passive income side where you have money working for you as opposed to you working for money. So um, when you talk about investments, it's always going to be the ideal scenario, but it's not the only form of the economics that we want to focus on. Very, 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 very good point that you just made is passive income. Now, I, I have to probably pull back to show number two and ask about the rites of passage and part of the rites of passage being, or think about in advance, part of the rites of passage being understanding passive income. Because people understand inheritance, they understand endowment, they understand um, full ride scholarships, and they understand graduating college with no student loans with a job on the spot. Whereas some of us, we don't even understand half of that stuff when it comes down to it. But part of building on our community and building on what it is we do is we want to keep that stuff in the forefront, keep it on our frontal load. Uh, well, I want to even take a step past that. One of the things that I notice a lot is that um, people need to get more knowledgeable about life insurance. Life insurance is meant to be in place where you rent wealth until you own it. It's not something that you need forever. It's for example, if you ha if you don't have three hundred thousand dollars saved up, then you need to have that in life insurance. So when something happens to you, you can pay off your home, you can fund your children's education, you can pay for that burial. You're renting that wealth because you so haven't you, had enough time to, and it's to so invest you saying that, like that. So what you're saying is somebody like LeBron James would have life insurance right now. He wouldn't need it right now. Correct. He wouldn't okay. need it. It would be an option. He well, wouldn't need it unless okay. his mind doesn't okay. work that way. Some people still have it, though, because it's a, it's, a, it's a vehicle that you can use to pass an inheritance. That's how wealthy people continue to get wealthy when okay. they pass away. Their estate becomes richer because of how they have it established. I have a mentor who has a $5 million insurance policy where he's allocating a million dollars to an educational fund for his entire family. Uh, he has an entrepreneur fund because he said he's sick and tired of people watching commercials and saying, damn, I had that same idea, but I couldn't start the business because I didn't have the money. He has a million dollars for health insurance for the family so they can always be able to access uh, different things that they need from a medical standpoint. And then the rest he has allocated to his wife and children. So when you understand life insurance further than what the black community sees it as is just burial insurance, then you're able to transfer wealth from generation to generation. Okay. So... So let me pose this question. Are we trying to do more of making ourselves reflect the dominant culture or are we wanting to do something a different way and establish our own thing for think, the black that's not, culture? That's not necessarily reflecting the dominant culture. Yeah. That's an economic. I mean, it's, okay. it's money. But let's it's say money. that this, okay, but we know that this system has the capacity, the, this system is at its own breaking point. So yeah. are we looking to do something revolutionary that's different where we, because in, in some circles people are looking to return to the, the, the community where you're self-sustaining and not continuing the structure that is, because that structure is doomed I, to fail I at think, some point in time. I think that is revolutionary. Um, I heard Michael Bazin comment, imagine if all of the families who had children get killed 
in Chicago if they all had $100,000 policies. In one day, 20 youth had got killed. That insurance company would have had to shell out a lot of money in order to prevent from doing that in the future. They would have invested money in the community to make it safer so that they don't have to lose money because that's a lot of money to be shelling out. So that's, a, again, that's a money principle, but that's information that's not privy to our community because it's not talked about. Our parents don't sit us down and talk about life insurance. Well, I think a lot of this goes into um, the psychology of the way the average American things. I don't even think at this point it's black or white. I think this is the average American period. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. We don't understand our money. Most people don't understand compound interest. They don't understand passive income. And I will say, Mm -hmm. and they definitely don't understand fiat currency. And I will say to this point, I'm not necessarily a fan of a society based solely on um, everyone trying to achieve a level of status to where they have a substantial amount of passive income coming in. Because I think as a whole, um, in order to create wealth, you have to create something. You know, you have to, you have to with your hand, make something. Um, if everybody's sitting around buying stuff from everybody else, yeah, we all have passive income and everybody's living comfortably. But in my opinion, at that point, Culture stops moving forward. Society stops progressing because there's no more innovation. There's no more. Um, there's no more building. There's no more creating. There's just mm-hmm. collecting. consumerism mm-hmm. and materialism. And I think I think that's the breaking point that America has reached. And don't get me wrong. I'm in the same boat. Hey, I've written four books. Um, I do regular speaking engagements and all of that, so I'm I'm about, I'm all about passive income. I'm trying to get mine up right now. I think <laughs> you they know? kind of go hand in hand. Uh, you definitely have to have creation, and the the pursuit of monetary gain is what inspires creation. Um, or does it? Um, it? It does. You would not have the creation of the car had Henry Ford thought that he would not be able to become wealthy off of its creation. They would not have created the iPhone if they did not think they would become wealthy. Well, but once again, using the standard of the dominant culture, what about the creation of the pyramid? That was on the metaphysical level, not for seeking, and it's one of the most greatest creations of all human in human existence. And it solved a I think it, it, need, it was right? still recognized, I believe, from a monetary standpoint because it was built for the wealthiest of wealthy, the pharaohs. If we were building technology for the sake of advancing humanity and not monetary gain, is monetary gain something of European culture and not our mm-hmm. culture, and we're just trying to mirror that. I don't think it necessarily matters. From what I read in the Jewish phenomenon, their belief is that God used the um, money as a, as a vehicle, so to speak, for creation. Yeah. They believe that you're not God and you're not making money because the only way that you can receive money if you're not taking it from anybody or conning somebody is that you would have to render a service, and then with you rendering that service, a person will givingly give you the money and receipt of that. So if you look at it, people who make the biggest amount of money, they impact the biggest amount of people by what they do. So it depends on your perspective on money. They were saying money that is a tool. That's, yeah, why, yeah. that's why money is yes. written on money, yeah. um, that in God we trust. We got away from it, but our forefathers wanted to subtly remind people of the importance of God, and that money is a place where everybody would see it. So putting it on money, it'll be seen 
more than putting it in the church because people go there and they automatically know that. So they put it on the, the place, they put it on the object that'll be seen most but least expected. Hmm. So tell me what your Black Wall Street, anyone, what is Black Wall, what would a strong community that's like. economically sound look like right now? Okay. I'm, I'm actually, because I have some things that are actually in the works with some other groups of folks, and it includes having CPAs, doctors, lawyers, bank, bankers, accountants, and the whole gambit working on several different projects at several different times. Um, it, it means that I have a mechanic shop where anybody that needs to come in and work on their car themselves can do that themselves, or they can get a, a mechanic and bring them in with them. I'm not going to charge you the mechanic fees. It means that I have a bank where if you come in and you're depositing your $30 a month in the bank, you have access to funds that you didn't ha have access to. It's not circumventing, but it's creating a substructure that if the American economy completely collapses, there will be enough resources available for us to be able to eat and sleep and feed our people, including land ownership. You know, and it, and it, would have, it would be set up so that we could flip a switch to the barter system at any given time because yes. everyone has its own special. I think um, to kind of piggyback what uh, Madison is saying, um, the root of everything, I believe, is the education at home. Everything that you receive comes with directions except for money. Your clothes come with and directions on how to wash it. Food comes with directions on how to prepare it. But money doesn't come with directions. And they don't teach you at school about money and how it works. So I think it needs to be a formal education, so to speak, that's embedded within the culture or in your family that teaches you about money because you're not going to get that um, knowledge anywhere else? Well, I think, I mean, for me, a strong Black Wall Street is simple. Um, I agree completely with what Madison said about having a structure in place to um, be able to survive regardless of what happens. But for me, it's, it's real simple, and it breaks down to um, the community being in control of its own financial money supply, you know, of its own money supply, its own right. economic future. Um, and it's just that simple for me. Um, I do think when you're talking about money, it's hard to just talk about what the purpose of money is or what the root or the goal of money is, even as a tool or as a, 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 a object of admiration, adoration, and affection, or whatever else you want to call it, without entering into the discussion, the mindset of the people that have the money. Um, and when I say that, I say um, it's all well and good to think that if a black community has all of these different certified people to administer all these different skills, um, then the black community itself is self-sufficient. That's all well and good to think that until you enter in the psychological component of it all. Um, black people, it's, it's a proven entity. We have a a uh, negative, negative stereotype of ourselves. We would rather spend our money outside of our community than spend it in our community. And I think when you start talking about a black economic base, you have to start with thinking about the way the average black consumer looks at the average black business. The fourth thought on that is that once, we, once that right of passage is in place, once that system and, and that education happens in the home, and it's su supplemented by the community. And we have these types of discussions, the ones that we're having right now, and our listeners have these types of discussions on their own. That's going to solidify that people need to do something a little bit different than they were doing so that we can actually have tangible, long-standing economic base for not just my business but your business so that I can call everybody I know and tell them about what it is you do black, white, American, not a white, American, whatever it is, um, government entities and contracts, whatever it is, I need to be able to plug somebody into the game and I need somebody ready. And not only somebody, it's the people that are going to be, that have been through a process or a rites of passage and understand how this thing is going to play out. Okay. You guys have I given me some thoughts about the rites of passage. Um, 
in the sense of think of uh, the more traditional societies where young boys are sent on a journey, um, be it Papua New Guinea or wherever they've come up, they have to take a journey to the other side of the island um, to go learn how to be a man. Um, you guys have, have brought that to the forefront of my mind that what what if a rite of passage was our youth at some point in time, 13, 14, whatever, they have to travel to go be taught in uh, certain areas of economics, um, you know, how to carry on the mantle of of a family, you know, prepping them for these things. What do you guys think about something like that? I don't necessarily think it should just be one, like, certain stage in our life. I think it should just be, like, a... Thor a th um, Constant. Yeah. A gradual, yeah, a gradual thing. Like from when they born, when they are born, you teach them things about economics. It shouldn't so be no okay. Now marker. Say, yeah, I mean, I know well, a guy I think, that. Like, uh, I think that that could be beneficial, but it still would need to be um, something that's rooted that encourages continual growth and advancement. I think Madison's right. head on best learning those um, different professions, skills, or trades yeah. because that's that's something that's intangible that can't be taken away from you. If we're in America or anywhere we go, we'll be able to render that particular service to um, generate wealth. And I, I just think that's, that's so key oh, right. and critical. That's one of the reasons why I believe the Jim Crows was established because the white slave masters didn't have any skills. They relied on us to do everything. So with us being released to the workforce, so to speak, they they couldn't compete with us. So they had to create a law to not have to compete with us. So what specific trades would you like? Yeah, what do you think? think, what'd you think of having? I think you would have to look at the strong suit of, of the individuals themselves at that point. I'm a strong proponent of the idea that um, kids should be taught how to think, then they should be taught a soft skill, something like a professional business okay. consultant, Lean Six Sigma, something okay. like that, where they can grow business, and then they should be taught a hard skill, something like mechanics, something like uh, where they build stuff with their hands, some sort of craftsmanship. That way... Um, if they can't build things with their hands, then they have something with their minds that they can intelligently fall back on and bring that to the community. And if they can't bring that okay. to the community, then they can build something with their hands. And if all those fails, they have the tools to sit down and figure it out on their own from start to business. Okay, I'm a Lean Six Sigma expert, and I'm a master craftsman. I should be able to put these two together to make something wonderful for this community. So let's start touching on our on our uh, on our points steps to action, action as we see our yeah. Okay. So let's uh, some steps to action. Um, how do we implement these community economics and start getting us on the on the right path? I think everybody on this call should be looking towards and, and able to identify what your second and third stream of income is. I think we should work internally on de developing those second and third streams of income with each other so that once we really do um, have an outpouring of support from our listeners, they're going to start asking us exactly how did we do it. That puts another soft skill in our bucket. It puts another tangible skill in our bucket. And we'll be able to teach them how to break down the process that we went through and understand the process instead of the end result, which is usually money, which is usually what people are focused on. But when we strip right. everything away and we focus on the system we use, and the process we followed, there are going to be a lot of people moving towards a better direction. I, I think basically what we're talking about is what was uh, in place before, um, I would say, the Industrial Revolution, where everybody pretty much owned their own business in the sense of their particular trade. They were like the blacksmith, and then they had apprentices, so to speak. But the Industrial Revolution um, made it where it was corporations, so mm -hmm. each person individually didn't own their their their, uh, their means of production. Your means of production. Correct. Mm -hmm. Correct. So you you went out of 
you went from self ownership to being uh employee. Yeah. <laughs> the the employee system is mm-hmm. what really eliminated a lot of biz, small business ownership and a lot of trade skills or uh skills in general because you had a system that and that didn't allow you to have to think or critically think. So we have to come up with a way to develop the skills that's needed in the community where we don't have to go outside of the community or to a uh, uh, established institution, so to speak, to get what we need. Okay. Okay, so let me see. So I have owning your trade. I have um, identifying second, third string income from Madison, um, teaching the process. How would we be able to get that into individual homes for parents to be able to pass that on to their children? With this one, I think um, the school and public education would be the best way to go when you think about the tracks they have. Back in the day, um, there were multiple tracks, and they all did different things. Nowadays, you have the college track and the non-college track, and pretty much the only difference is on the college track, you have to take two years of a foreign language, at least in Florida. That's the way it works. Public schools are um, not yeah. going back that way. I can tell you that. Pub- I work in the public schools. They're, not, they're, they're all about testing right now. Well, So we, I mean, we can't even – I would personally say that that's not even a, an, an option in the sense of – I school had a year. Well, I'm not saying get it back into public schools. I'm saying I think they had the right idea back in the day with the tracks where, you know, if you weren't, if you weren't uh, college bound, you went on a uh, handyman track and you learned the yeah. skill so that when you left high school, you could provide for your family without having to go to college. I think a system like that, would be beneficial to the community. Now, obviously, you just confirmed the public school system isn't going to go that way, which means we need to, in my opinion, we need to start looking at other ways of mass educating our youth at least into an apprenticeship level. They don't have to graduate as master craftsmen, but at least graduate with the basic skills so that they can go to a master craftsman and say, I know this, and I can be beneficial right now. Can you take me on and show me the rest? Okay, and that and that's it. That's what we're True. you know right here is how do we get this into the home, Madison? I know you got something in your heart. <laughs> this Warren, uh, I think it's twofold. I think the first twofold. thing is what Madison was saying as far as we need to establish these entities so that they're in place. But at the same time, uh, I think it was Patrick who said that we have to teach the children how to critically think. So once we teach them how to critically yeah. think and these systems are in place, then we can have them do internships or apprenticeships so that they can see what they like or what they're good at and then pursue that even further. But one of the challenges I face going into college is I haven't been exposed to enough things to know what I actually like. I just did right. whatever they told me to do. So that wasn't necessarily yeah. the right way to go. So I think that's what needs think- to happen. From a today's standpoint, we need to embrace technology. Like one of the things that nobody's been talking about is social media. This is a new phenomenon. That's a track in itself is just attacking social media and how to use that and navigate that and help grow your business or your brand or it's a commodity in itself. That's true. So what you are suggesting is basically what you are suggesting is basically introducing from from birth introducing your children to different things so that they can go into opposed to just telling them to do this specific thing or go into the specific area. Is that, is that um, what, I'm, what, what I'm saying is the first thing is to teach them that critical thinking skill because that's invaluable. Okay. You can you can you can survive because you go adapt to your situation. Okay. But once you establish okay. that critical thinking ability, now you have resources where you can plug them into 
the apprenticeship to get a feel for it to see if that's okay. something that they want to do. And now they have a okay. so on the social media tip. Can I can I get the shovel and dig in on this one because it, you last have to point and then we're gonna wrap it up, Madison. At last point, and then we'll wrap it up. We have to teach our children and our kids and our friends and everybody on Facebook and Instagram and all this face pics and butt twicks in the mirror and the bathroom pics <laughs> that social media is now the difference between push through and pull through marketing. When the iPhone came out, everybody ran to it. They were pulled or drawn into it. Now. The money is being made by pushing information out to everybody with a smartphone. There's billions of dollars being made daily just from social media. Your ads and all this stuff, this is a psychological warfare as well as a technological warfare. They stacked two processes and said, we're about to get paid. There are so many resources out there that tell you exactly how they were planning on doing it that when you look at the Facebook hashtags, I can search hashtag UI. I can find people that like Malcolm X and send them all the Malcolm X posters as UI, and they're going to say, you know what, let me go follow them, right? These are strategies yeah. and tactics that are being deployed as we speak, and people are getting eaten alive. And until we teach people what's really going on, they're going to keep going in the same old place. Mm-hmm. Hey, how y'all doing? This is Jackson. I broke away for a second, but I just wanted to dive in because you, you jumped on the social media and you were talking about trades. I think in the age of technology and, you know, building our community, community economics, getting our life together, we really need to see social media and the Internet as a trade. There is no need to go to school to get $80,000, $100,000 in debt to learn how to code or to learn how to be a social media analyst. I have a friend. 22 years old, no college degree, but she earns $20 an hour as a social media analyst for a company just because she knows how to build a couple of Facebook pages, interact on Twitter, and do some other things. So a friend of mine actually warned, you know, we're, we're going to work together and build a not well, he has a nonprofit organization, but I want to add an initiative to it that teaches high school kids the, so, how to become a social media analyst and to give them basic coding information so that they can take on internships as 16, 17, 18-year-olds, and then by the time they turn 18, 19, 20, they can get into the job field in these markets that are paying forty, fifty, sixty, seventy thousand dollars $70,000 plus per year, all because you know a little bit more than the average person on social media. Mm-hmm critical mm-hmm. we just we really got to open our eyes up it's just like being a mechanic it's the same thing it's just a different trade in a new in a new millennium so I, that was my two points that's a good point but, but, but to pop on all these points and you excuse me because i'm a psychology buff i'm big into it i love it um but to jump into all these points all of that has to do with the, the, the psychology of our community and the, the belief that they're capable of doing these things. I mean, you know, they say uh, you have at least six ideas every day that if you pursue them will make you a millionaire. Right. So, you know, everybody has the capacity to do these things. It's just it seems like in our community more so than the other communities, there isn't any belief in the idea even that we can be um, economically independent or even economically responsible for ourselves without some type of assistance from somebody, whether that be mom, dad, Uncle Sam, um, Uncle Luke from down the street, or uh, whoever else you want to call it. So, you know, all of the initiatives are fine. I just think, especially when you're talking about economics, um, there's a critical psychological component to it that, you know, I sit and talk in front of kids all day about different things, and until you make them believe that they can actually do it, you're just wasting your time and it. I think that the individuality, the individualism of of the American culture is is the issue. We are commutarianists by nature. What's yours is mine. What's mine is yours. And for me, 
I would think that if we can get back to understanding that if we bring money back into our own community, spend money at only black-owned businesses, that's your money. That's your money. That's your community. That is, that's, that's yours that you're building up. If we can get back to that mentality that it's ours, then I think maybe we'll have a, start, a good starting point. But right now, as long as we're propping people up to do it on their own or have their own individual wealth, that's where we're going to keep failing. And that's where the other culture has won over us because they can do it on their own. They have that privilege. We don't. And I we're like of the mind. You know what I'm saying? I think I, I really think we need to get back to to us, ours. I think I think you need to make that as a bullet as far as the whole economics and the community is. Everybody taking pride in that black-owned business and seeing it as theirs, so to speak. Okay. I think that's huge. And on that note, you guys want to wrap it up? Do we have any final points on community economics and rebuilding of a black Wall Street? It can be done. Uh, my yeah. final points would be, um, as always, it starts at home first, that education about um, money, economics, and how to handle your money it would need to start at home and then it will be reinforced through life. Definitely teaching children how to think and how to critically think is going to be important. And then branching off into learning a trade, a profession, some type of skill that no matter if you are in America or you are abroad, you will always be able to make money because you have a skill that's needed and that you can use to generate to own, um, to make money. And then uh, I don't know who raised the point, but I think that's key when you come, when you introduce being creative and building things with your hands, you're, you're always going to have to be able to create something because eventually things will go plateau. So it's going to take some kind of innovation to keep furthering um, the community. Mm -hmm. All right, gentlemen. I think we can bring this conversation to a close. It's been the UI experience.